Optimization problems involving composite function models. I mean, that's a fancy title. Basically, it means we we're gonna see some chain rule in here as we're doing these derivatives. And there's slightly different setups in, in the questions. I mean, they're, they're not, they don't follow the same patterns necessarily of the one we've seen. Uh, the first one starts with minimizing a distance. So uh, it's not making any mystery about what we're trying to min minimize. And it says, which points on the graph of y equals nine minus x squared are closest to the point zero six. So these type of questions, it's awfully tempting to think you need a perfect graph of the situation. And while a perfect graph of the situation can help a little bit, now I'll draw a decent one. Um, it, it's not completely necessary if, if you know what you're doing or if you've seen one of these before. So um, here I go with, um, a decent graph of this. 9 minus x squared is a, is, a, is a downward opening parabola. Moved up 9. So it's up about here. And that point there is at 0, 9. And again, if that doesn't come very quickly to you, that's okay. You don't really need to know that. In my example, I'm, I'm going to do a decent graph, not a perfect graph, so you get the idea. Now, we want to know which point is closest to the point zero 06. So here's zero 06 right here, and I've exaggerated a little bit just to give a little bit of room for my diagram here. But life's pretty simple here, actually. We want to know there's some point out here, and I don't know exactly where it is, you know, somewhere about there. And that point is the closest one on that parabola to 0, 6. And you might have noticed that actually there's another point over here. And I'll, I'll pretend like I don't know that, you know what I mean? Like, I, I just put it on there, I know, I know, I'm going to get rid of it. And, and just watch how the math plays out here, because the math sort of takes care of that problem for me, finding that other point. So basically what I'm trying to do is minimize that distance right there to find the point on this graph that's closest there. Well, really all I'm going to use is the Pythagorean theorem, is that I want to know uh, this triangle here, where this is delta x and this is delta y, basically. I want to know... Um, that, that'll be my formula for finding distance here. And actually, the distance formula is one that you used back in grade 10, but I mean, that's so long ago that uh, you might not remember it. So I'll show it here again. But again, it's just um, the Pythagorean theorem, d squared equals delta x squared plus delta y squared. But in, back in grade 10, you maybe saw it as d equals square root x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. That's the way we talked about it there. But it really is just Pythagorean theorem. I hope seeing it again now makes you see that really all we were doing was Pythagorean theorem to find that distance there. Well, what are the two points? This uh, the initial point is 0, 6, and this uh, point on the parabola is x comma 9 minus x squared is the y value of a uh, point on that curve. So those are the x and y's I'm going to use there. So what I'm doing here is going, okay, uh, for the x's, I go d equals square root x2 was uh, x, x1 is 0, so that's x minus 0 squared. And then for the y2, I'm using this 9 minus x squared here, 9 minus x squared minus the y1, which is the 6. Okay, so uh, take a second to see that you see where I get those points. I'm going to highlight the x's in yellow. See, there's x minus 0, and then I'll highlight um, the y's in green, um, 9 minus x squared and 6. So there's how I find the delta x and the delta y, basically the length of the two sides of that triangle that I've built there. So... Uh, I'm going to tidy that up a little bit before I think about taking the derivative. Um, I get d equals square root x squared plus, uh, how is this going to look the best? Maybe 3 minus x squared, and that's all squared. Um, now, there's a little trick we can use on these type of ones, and it's tough to explain the first time. And usually we write a fancy sentence here, and I'll write the fancy sentence in a minute, but I just want to talk about maximizing things underneath the square root. And there's two ways to understand what I'm going to do next. One way is to say, um, if you want to minimize the square root of something, just minimize what's underneath it. 
So it doesn't, I don't have to worry about the square root. As long as what's inside there, and I'll just underline it, as long as that's a minimum, then the square root of it will be a minimum. Like the minimum of a square root is, is to get the minimum number inside the square root. That maybe seems a little obvious. The other way to think about it is to think if I take this derivative, I'm going to end up with that derivative of that inside as the numerator. And then the denominator, I won't really care about um, in the sense that uh, it's not going to be part of uh, getting the minimum because that, that, that square root part will always be positive. Well, I'll sort of show it both ways here. It's because once we have this formula for d and we're trying to minimize a distance, that's the moment where we now just find the derivative. So let me just go through that and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that shortcut that we could use here. Um, so to get, rid of, get ready for doing the derivative, I, I, I'd write this as uh, x squared plus 3 minus x squared squared, and that's all to the power of 1 half. And if I was to take that derivative, d prime, uh, take derivative, I get d equals, uh, let's see, 1 half x squared plus 2 bracket 3 minus x squared times negative 2x, whole mess of chain rule in there. Let me just slow that down for a minute. I brought the 1 half out front. Oh, no, I messed that up. Got carried away. <laughs> Uh, let's see, one half, and then all that stuff inside stays the same. Yeah, that's the chain. That's the, the first part of the chain rule. Then the second part of the chain rule is the derivative of the inside, which would be two x plus two bracket three minus x squared. That would be to power one times this negative two x. So there's the derivative of the inside there. Now, what you find out right away is that uh, if I simplify that. I get, uh, on the bottom, I get 2, and then the square root of this thing that I argue we don't really care about because it's always going to be positive. And then I get this numerator. And that's the, the part I really care about. And so you'll see a lot of books do something like this, they'll say it suffices to minimize d equals, and they use a capital D usually for these, um, that inside, x squared plus 3 minus x squared squared. So if you buy into what I said before, which is if I minimize what's inside the square root, I'll minimize the square root. And so they just do d prime on that, and they just get that numerator there. So you could continue on and just do d prime equals 2x plus 2 bracket 3 minus x squared times negative 2x. And you could just work on that. Now, some people when I do that don't really buy into it. They don't believe it. They think I'm, I'm, I'm doing some trickery there. So I'm not going to do that here, even though you're welcome to. Yes, I've showed you how, and you could just go ahead and do... Um, that is just minimize the inside of the square root. I'll carry on with this d prime over here and show you that it actually plays out the same way anyways. So um, for max min, set d prime equal to zero. And if you're thinking, well, I think I'd, uh, I think I'd tidy up that first that numerator first, I, I know I, in this particular example, I'm not going to because I'm really trying to show something off here and I get zero equals uh, and the numerator is 2x plus 2 times 3 minus x squared. I'm resisting the temptation to simplify that numerator, which I really should. And then I get 2 square root x squared plus 3 minus x squared all on the bottom. Um, <clears throat> 3 minus x squared squared. Did I drop that x squared along there? Yeah, I did. So that should be a squared there. And that's a squared. And then that's a squared. I dropped that squared along. You know, I... I've done these so many times, I, I know I don't care about that denominator, so I just didn't even bother keeping up with everything I needed in there. And maybe you, as you were watching the video, you're like, hey, hey, hey you forgot something there. Um, it doesn't matter. So I now bring that whole new denominator over and multiply it by zero. So what I actually get is zero equals 2x plus 2 times 3 minus x squared times negative 2x. And the person over here goes, uh, set d prime equal to zero, and they get the same thing. Do you see? So... You don't have to believe me. You can do it 
the way I'm showing on the left hand side, that's fine. I, it's, it's, it, it's an extra couple of steps, but I just wanted to show that because you'll see that in textbooks and you'll see that in solutions and examples where they say it suffices to minimize the inside and they just focus on the inside of that square root. Okay, so I'm going to continue on because it's the same on both sides now. Um, so what do I get is, uh, you know, 0 equals 2x uh, minus 4x times 3 minus x squared. I like putting the monomials together first before I multiply this in, but uh, you can handle that any way you want. And I get 0 equals 2x minus 12x minus 4x cubed. Uh, no, a plus 4x cubed. Yeah, negative 4x times negative 4x squared would be uh, uh, positive 4x cubed. So I get uh, 0 equals 4x cubed minus 10x, which is weird looking. And you, you might be tempted to do all sorts of crazy stuff to this. But in the end, it's a common factor. 0 equals 2x times 2x squared minus 5. And so I'll just do a work over here. I'll just draw a line there saying, okay, I'm really done with that side. And unless you are buying into my argument and you're going to use that, that, that move because I, I like it perfectly well. So I get x equals 0 or 2x squared minus 5 equals 0. So I get 2x squared equals 5, x squared equals 5 halves, and x equals plus or minus square root 5 halves. What a strange looking result. And if you're really on top of this, you're thinking, why am I getting three points here? You sort of mentioned one, and you sort of talked about the second one, which we think is more sort of a symmetrical point over here, but why am I getting a third point here? Well, I'm going to build my derivative table and try and get to the bottom of this, because I got these three values I got to work through. So when I build my derivative table, um, where's my, my, my derivative is uh, d prime equals... Uh, the numerator was, okay, I'm going to use the simplified numerator that I ended up with way down here after I did all the simplification here. Um, it's uh, 2x bracket 2x squared minus 5. And that all had on the bottom this 2 square root x squared plus 3 minus x squared squared. And if you're worried about that now and you're thinking, well, yo, you, in the one version of it you said you didn't have to worry about all that. I'm like, well, I, I stick to what I said. Um, I don't really have to worry about all that because watch what happens when I go to build the table here. I'm going to try and um, see if I can uh, buy myself some space here. Um, so I need uh, three sections. I need um, to look at the table here, and I've jammed myself in a position here, so I'll just uh, cheat a little bit there <laughs> with uh, my pen. And I need uh, x less than negative root 5 over 2, and then between negative root 5 over 2, oops, root 5 over 2, and 0, and between 0 and root 5 over 2, and then uh, finally x greater than root 5 over 2. And you know what, when you build these and you got all these root 5 over 2s laying around, maybe it's good to have the decimal version of it ready to rock and roll. x equals plus or minus, um, I get 1.58. You know what I mean? Like, looking at root 5 over 2, you're like, well, what numbers am I going to plug in there? And, uh, you know, you got to think about that for a second. And I think you'll find that if you select a negative number and, and, and you sub it into all this thing, that this bottom always comes out to be positive. So I'm going to draw a giant positive over that. That bottom is always positive, and that's why we don't care about it. It's not going to change the signs and the tables at all. But again, if you want to carry it around, I, I'm not trying to convince you. I'm just trying to tell you, you're going to see that shortcut sometimes where they don't worry about that square root so much. Anyways, what you'll find is if you use a, less, a number less than negative root 5 over 2, you get negative. And then if you use a number between negative 1.58 and 0, you get positive. Between 0 and 1.58, you'll get negative again. And then you'll get positive. And what you end up with here is a minimum, which is what we were after, a minimum at x value, negative root 5 over 2. Okay, so that's the first one we talk about. So there's the minimum right there. Negative root 5 over 2. Yes, that's good. We found that minimum. And then we find another minimum way over here. Minimum at root 5 over 2, comma, something. And then this one in between was a max. 
at zero comma. Okay, so we don't want that one. That was a maximum distance we got out to there. And my diagram might not show that very well, but this is a minimum distance, and then this moved out to a maximum distance. And uh, this is where why I said the accurate diagram isn't necessary because your math is going to tell you. You're going to get your, your, your math here. And I don't care about that y value of the maximum, but I do care about these y values of the minimum. And when I sub those in, I think I get 13 halves as those two points. When I sub those in, you can sub those in and check those if you want. So the closest points... are negative root 5 halves comma 13 halves and root 5 halves comma 13 halves, okay? So lots going on in that question. Those aren't particularly easy, but you do have a nice formula. Those of you who are like, oh, what formula do I use? These ones do have a nice formula. Is it the distance formula? And I'll give that a nice highlight. There it is there in the form you're going to want to use it. Um, for finding the minimum distance between two points, one of them that's on a curve and one of them that is given. Okay, next one. Oh, something going on here. Something's moved around on me here, so I just need a second here to move this down here. move. Oops. <laughs> right back in. Uh, there we go. That quick picture of my daughter there, did you? Turn off the keyboard. Okay. Next question. Did that mess up my spacing down here too? Yeah, it did. So I'll just give that a couple of move downs there. That should fix that. Okay. All ready to go on the second out of three problems here today. Um, deciding when two objects are closest to each other. So this time it's a, a north-south highway intersects an east-west highway at point P. Well, let me get that on there right now. Um, some kind of north-south highway like that. And then an east-west highway like that. Now I knew how, which way to draw these because I know which way this question is going to go. But there's my two highways. Um, a vehicle crosses P at 1 o'clock, traveling east at a constant speed of 60 kilometers an hour. At the same instant, another vehicle is 5 kilometers north of P, traveling south at 80 kilometers an hour. Find the time when the two vehicles are closest to each other. So we're doing, again, doing minimum distance. Closest to each other. Minimum distance. And I think you'll find that in situations like this, where you have a certain time where you know some information, and then sometime later, it helps to draw two diagrams. Here's the one o'clock diagram. At one o'clock, what was happening? A vehicle crosses P traveling east. So at one o'clock, there was a car right here, and uh, now you're gonna find out how unbelievably bad I am at drawing things. There's a car heading east, and it was right there at P at one o'clock. So at one o'clock, it was there. And then uh, there's a, a vehicle five kilometers north of there. So right there, there's here's another vehicle. Okay, sideways vehicle coming out. Ooh. All my little vehicles always look the same. So along the way, I memorized how to draw a little minivan type thing. And it's heading this way. And this is what's happening at one o'clock. And you might have other ways to handle this, but I find it easier to draw two diagrams to go, okay, what's going on at one o'clock? And then sometime later, they're going to get to a minimum distance. That is... Sometimes later, after 1 o'clock, the situation is going to look more like this. The first vehicle is going to move down here, and I'm going to draw it really small here. And just write... Oh, a second vehicle, sorry. Second vehicle is there, and now this first vehicle will have moved out to somewhere like there. And this gives me nice Pythagorean theorem set up, because there's the distance between them right there. Okay, so now all I got to do is find the length of these two sides. Well, the length of this side at the bottom, uh, the car traveling east is going 60 kilometers an hour. So this distance here is 60t, where t is an hour. So, you know, you're just multiplying um, distance equals velocity times time. You're just using that equation to say, okay, take the velocity and multiply it by how much time has passed after 1 o'clock. 
This side's a little more difficult in that it started at five kilometers and it's getting shorter. Well, how fast is that car going? Oh, 80 kilometers an hour. So this one will be five kilometers, subtract 80 kilometers each hour will be that distance there. Now, uh, listen, this is hours we're talking about and these things are moving very high speeds. We expect a very short number of hours before we get minimum distance here. Well, we're right back to Pythagorean theorem again. Uh, D squared equals delta y squared plus delta x squared. You can write that if you want, but I think my diagram really shows what's happening here. The delta y is 5 minus 80t, and the delta x is 60t, and that's all squared. And you could do this as a... Um, crazy nuts chain rule question. You could right there convert that over, and I'll talk about that a little bit, but I think that these brackets aren't too bad. Uh, my advice is if you get little brackets like this, you just multiply them out. So if I square that bracket, I'll get 5 minus 80t times 5 minus 80t. See, that's not the worst multiplying out ever. I don't think chain rule was really invented to deal with squared brackets. You know, like if it's just squared, multiply it out, make yourself pretty happy by just multiplying this out. So I think when I multiply those out, I get, uh, let's see, I'm gonna uh, 25 minus 400T minus another 400T, 6400T squared, plus 3,600 T squared. And when I finish tying that up, I'm gonna have D equals square root, I think it's 10,000 T squared, minus 800 T, plus this 25, sticking out the end there. Okay, so life is pretty good here. But I'm gonna try this trick I learned, uh, or that I talked about in the previous example, is to say, uh, this fancy trick that they like, and they like to phrase it really weird here. It suffices to minimize D equals 10,000 T squared minus 800 T plus 25. And the simplest way I can think of to explain why that works is if I minimize what's under the square root, I'll have minimized the square root. You know, if I get the smallest number I can underneath the square root, that'll give me the smallest number overall. Now you can go through it and do the derivative, but in the end, all that square root stuff will end up in the denominator and won't really matter for finding the zero of this thing. So life is good here. Take derivative. D prime equals 20,000 T minus 800. Well, and then uh, four max min. Set D prime equal to zero. This is actually a really nice derivative and so on. A sort of a difficult setup, but pretty nice when you go to solve it. I'm gonna go this way with it. Negative 20,000 T equals negative 800. T equals negative 800 over negative 20,000. As expected, we're gonna get a really small number of hours here. I get 0 0.04 hours. Now, that's fine. I mean, I don't mind if people say things like 0 0.04 hours. That's not how we usually talk. If we wanted this in minutes, we'd go time equals 0 0.04 hours times 60 minutes per hour. And so what we'd get is 24 minutes. I think that's a better answer. Uh, sorry, 2.4 minutes. And then 2.4 minutes, again... Uh, that's, we don't really talk in minutes like that, so this 0 0.4 minutes, if we wanted that in seconds, we'd multiply that by 60, and I'd get 24 seconds. So it's uh, time equals 2 minutes, 24 seconds. And if you've never seen one of those conversions before, well, this is a good time for it, because answers will come up in decimals and really we want them in minutes and seconds and because minutes and seconds is 60s instead of a hundreds you got to do sort of a weird conversion there let's make sure i've answered the question what find the time the time uh therefore the time for minimum 
distance is, well, it was one o'clock and two extra minutes and then 24 seconds. So that's te technically how it is. Now, if you said this in words, I don't really have a problem with it if you say it in words, you know, like uh, two minutes and 24 seconds after one o'clock, that's fine. But I'm just showing you the, you know, the sort of technical version of that. Okay, last one. And this one, very, very popular in, um, and, and this was stolen from a textbook and that's why it has this strange phrasing there. Recall the problem in setting the stage. Well, let's talk about this problem a little bit. Um, and this is gonna have a crazy diagram. So uh, if you've sort of drifted off to sleep and those first two are like, well, your algebra's strong. So you're like, okay, those aren't gonna be really a problem here. Take a good look at this one because this one's got a, a couple little quirks in. George wants to power run a power line to a new cottage being built on an island that is 400 meters from the shore of a lake. What? Okay, well, so here's the shore. And uh, I'm really unhappy with how neatly I wrote that. There's the shore. And then apparently George has an island out here. And he wants to get power out to it. So this is sort of upwards of a real world type problem when they when they run these massive cable lines to try and run power to different places. This is close to what they got to talk about to do this math. Um, he wants to run power line to a new cottage being built on an island that is 400 meters away from from the shore of a lake. There it is, out there in the water. The main power line ends three kilometers away from the shore that is closest to the island. So there's the closest point to the island, but the main power line ends way out here. So this is where the power is trying, he's trying to get power to this um, island of his that he's bought. Now, the cost of laying power line under the water is twice the cost of laying the power line on land. What does that mean? Uh, well, you can imagine that if you wanted to run electricity lines, putting them underneath a lake is not easy. I mean, it has to be done sometimes, but that is not a simple proposition. So in this example, they've said it costs twice as much to do that. Um, so then that leaves the question, what should George do here? I mean, there, there's a couple of ways that George can do this. George could say, okay, well, the shortest distance will be the cheapest. I'll just run the power line straight across to the island. And that could be right. That might be the way to do it. But we're gonna have to figure that out with the math. Not, uh, it could be that actually the, the best way to do it is to run the power line all the way along shore to the closest point and then run it across to the island. Only go across the water when you really have to. Maybe that's the best answer. Or maybe there's a third answer. Maybe it makes sense to run it as up to a point across the shore and then keep the power line cheap there, but then in the end, cut across a little bit to get that um, power line through the water at a smaller amount, but not necessarily the least uh, uh, distance through the water. You know, And so what I'm gonna do is say, well, I'm not really sure what the best way to go is. So I'll just say, okay, I'll set a point here, and this is gonna be the point that I cut across the water at, and say, okay, here's cutting across the water, and I'll call that X. And you might argue, well, um, that doesn't really incorporate those other two possibilities of, that maybe it's, I should cut across right to the island, or maybe I should go over to the closest point. And, the, and yeah, it really does, because I could find that X equals zero, or I could find that X equals three kilometers. In fact, let's deal with that three kilometers right now. You can see 400 meters and three kilometers. Um, this whole distance here is 3,000 meters. Let's put that kilometer thing to bed right here. And when I do it, I always strike it out. I don't know why I do that, but I, I just strike it out and go, okay, I took care of that. It's 3,000 meters. If, the, uh, if this distance over here is gonna be 400 meters, I better have this one in meters too. Back to the issue, uh, maybe I'll find that X equals 3,000. That'll tell me that uh, run the power line straight through the water. Maybe I'll find X equals zero. That'll tell me, okay, uh, go all the way up to the closest point and then run the, 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 uh, the power line across. See, the math will decide for me. Okay, well, uh, there's two parts to the cost here. Cost equals um, cost on shore plus cost, I almost put through water, but uh, that's not really accurate, it's cost under water, they're gonna run the power line 
right down deep along the floor of the lake there. Um, okay, well, cost on shore isn't too bad. The distance along shore is 3,000 minus X. So my cost equation here, I'm going to go right to C's now. C equals 3,000 minus X times the cost for the electricity on shore. And that's a bit of a problem, so I'll talk about that in just a second. And then the cost underwater, well, a little Pythagorean theorem here. This is gonna be, um, if that's, I'm gonna be square root x squared plus 400 squared. So this is gonna be x squared plus 400 squared times some amount here, or whatever it costs underwater. And a little discussion here about this. It says it costs twice as much, but they didn't say how much it was. Well, I'm going to do something that infuriates people when they first see it, and then I'll explain it at the end of the question. What I'm going to say is, I'm going to set the price here. I'm going to say it's uh, running it along the shore costs a dollar for every meter. And running it underwater here costs two dollars. You're like, can you do that? Can you just set it as a dollar and two dollars? And the answer is yes, actually, um, because as long as it's double, it'll work out. But that's hard to know when you first see a problem like this, that one and two will work. So here's what I'll do. I'll propose it. I'll say out loud, I'm going to try it with one and two. And then later on, I'll try and convince you that it's okay, because if it was 1,000 <coughs> and 2,000 or something like that, excuse me, if it was 1,000 and 2,000, that would cancel out along the way anyways. So you just have to believe me that that's true. It'll become a common factor later is what's going to happen. Anyways, for now, just believe me that it's going to be fine. And then I'll convince you. There'll be a key moment in this problem where I'll convince you that if I had wrote 1,000 and 2,000, if I had wrote 10,000 and 20,000, or if I had wrote C and 2C, any of those things would have canceled. So I'll, I'll show that as we go along. Anyways, so that makes my life pretty easy here. This is going to be $1 and this is going to be $2. If you don't buy into that, I don't, I don't expect you to. Wait, wait till it all plays out and I'll convince you. So it's actually a pretty nice C equation. C equals 3,000, oops, minus X plus, um, I forgot something here. That was supposed to be a square root. That x squared plus 400 squared right there. I just got writing away there. I don't want... See, see it was a square root there? Uh, right there. Yeah. And so I forgot that one half there, so I fixed that. Maybe as I was writing it, you were like, oh, where'd the square root go? And then, see, now I fixed it. Okay. So then this is um, 2 times x squared plus 16. I'm going to square that thing right now. 160,000 is what I get there. And then this is power one half. Oh, where'd my two go? My two went to the giant disappearing act. Uh, okay, so we're in great shape. This is not bad to take the derivative. Uh, uh, take derivative. C prime equals uh, negative one. Isn't that nice? And then the derivative here, let's see, 1 half times the 2 out front. Oh, that's already 1. So I get x squared plus 160,000 to the negative 1 half. And the derivative of the inside, which is 2x. So a little chain rule there. That's what's different in uh, today's word problems than previous ones is that there's a lot more chain rule here. And so um, for max min, Set C prime equal to zero, as we've been doing all the way along. Zero equals negative one plus 2x over, I'm going to tidy this up as I go, x squared plus 160,000. Um, so that, I, I always like bringing the negative over. So I get one equals 2x over square root of x squared plus 160,000. And then I do that cross multiply thing I've been doing. So I get square root x squared plus 160,000 equals 2x. And this is a weird situation. We haven't really seen one like this before where that square root enters back into play. And you're like, well, what do I do with the square root? Well, you, you square both sides. I get x squared plus 160,000. And this square of this side, I get 4x squared. 
And actually, this plays out pretty nicely because um, it's not too many terms. So I can actually just isolate here. You, you could go ahead and factor it or use the quadratic formula if you wanted, but this plays out pretty nicely. 160,000 over 3 uh, square root equals x. So I, I divided by 3, and I did that square root. I don't need the negative, because obviously I'm not going to go in negative distance here. And when I punch that all in my calculator, I get x equals 231 meters. Going back to my diagram up there, that means that he should get to a point 231 meters from the closest point before he starts cutting across in the water. Um, so let's talk about the one and two here and where that would have played out. Let's say that had been 1,000 and 2,000 instead. And I'll just write in here in green. Then that would have been 1,000 and that would have been 2,000. And then this would have been 1,000 and this would have been 2,000. And then right there, we could have divided both sides by a thousand, and the thousands would have disappeared. Interesting, right? Somebody else goes, well, yeah, that's just if it's thousand. What if it was, what if we really didn't even know the cost? You don't even know the cost here. How can you do stuff like that? You go, okay, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. So let's say I used it as um, C1 and C2. Sorry, uh, I don't want to use C1 and C2 because I already use C. So I'll use P for the price of hydro. And as I come down, I would have ended up with, uh, well, you do it in green here, I would have ended up with a P, and I would have ended up with 2P. And I moved this over, I would have got P, and I would have got P over here, and then right there, the P's would have cancelled. So as long as we keep it double, it works out. You'll see this in a lot of biology applications too, where as long as you make it double, it probably doesn't matter which ones you choose. And you're like, does that always true? Mm, I don't want to say always. But a lot of times in these situations, it plays out fine as long as you just use something that's double. Um, and I'll leave it to you to do the check here. I'll get it started for you. Zero less than x less than 231. x greater than 231. And uh, to check that C prime to make sure it does what we want it to do, we want to minimize cost. So we should see it go negative then positive there. Um, so a final statement here to wrap it up. Therefore, George should run the power along the shore until 231 meters from the closest point to the island. Then cut across. Okay, something like that. Okay, uh, okay, fair warning. I love, love, love that problem and have used it on many, many, many tests over the years. So that one's worth, if, if you're having difficulty with that one, that one's worth re-watching and worth finding in the homework and uh, making sure you practice that one because that one often appears, okay? All right, like I keep saying in word problems, the key is practice, practice, practice. There's not too many different versions here. And so the practice is going to pay off. So this isn't the type of homework you watch the lessons and go, oh, I sort of get that, and then just uh, take a nap. You really have to bite into this homework and make sure each type of problem you know how to handle it.